round of applause for Anna Fishbein. Uh, secondly, the theater's not that full, it's scattered. I'm gonna tell everybody before I even start talking to her, come on down here and make this more intimate. Come on, leave your seats now. Come on, get up, <laughs> come down. Come on, make this more intimate, come on. Let's go, you don't get to stay up in that back row, hell no, come on. Make this more intimate. While you're coming down, I'm Colin Costello, West Coast editor of Real 360, and I'm happy to have the writer, director, producer of Galaxy 360, Anna Fishbein, with me. Thanks so much, Colin. For sure. Um, so yeah, let, let's get right into it. Wow. <laughs> I want to suck it in and check my nipples before I even talk to you. Um, but that aside, uh, yeah, you made a really powerful film. Thank you. So first of all, um, just take me through the journey of from the inception of this. I mean, you said some, I'm, I'm going to get to it at the end, you said some really powerful things, but let's uh, talk about the inception of this, the inspiration, and the whole journey to getting it here. Um, okay, I, I guess I should start with the fact that I was an avid um, USA and Miss America watcher. I watched women on stage for years since I was a kid. And I used to, it took me a while to kind of figure this out, but then I thought, God, I, I never knew their names, you know? And it was the first thing that struck me was that we never knew their names. They were either Mississippi or Jersey, New Jersey or New York or whatever they were. And, you know, the, the bathing suit competition always fascinated me because um, the bathing suits were identical. And you know, you you looked at the at the and it was rated. We were rated, and it was just like this real thing where where our bodies were rated and they were marked against our talent. And I think that it, it took me until I I was already starting to make shows and to make movies that I that this actually came back to me this this childhood obsession. Um, but my first play in New York was called Sex in Mommyville. And I've been obsessed with sex, as you can tell, for as long as I can remember. And, you know, when I first came out with the play Sex in Mommyville, it was about how, um, th this was my true first inspiration, um, was the making of Sex in Mommyville, why I made it so I really wanted to have sex after I had babies. And my ex was always busy. And it was an embarrassing thing to say to people that I was the one who wanted sex. And, and, and when I made the play, the main actor, the main, the main character in the play wants to have sex. And, um, and, people, and people thought this was, you know, this was in 2010, the play came out in 2010. And it was like outrageous, like I was outrageous. And it, I, would co I would walk around in the streets and I would give out my little postcards to, to women and to men and I'd say, come to my play, Sex and Mommyville, it's about moms wanting sex. Or, and then the moms would look at me and they'd say, oh, you mean it's because we don't have any. And I started having these incredible conversations with all these women about how, you know, the, um, the political statement out there is that, you know, women are not satisfying men after they have babies. And that's why men are cheating. There was like an article that came out that if you wear more red and you do some lingerie stuff, then maybe he won't cheat on you. And everything that I was seeing was like about that. And I would watch TV at three in the morning and at three in the morning, literally commercials would go on that would say, you know, a woman would be on a treadmill and she would say, I am trying to lose weight for my husband and I want to look better for my husband so he finds me more attractive. And everything I saw was like this. It would be like over and over. And then of course the, 
Jesus Christ, the, sorry for anybody who's religious. Um, for any, you know, the commercials about looking younger, the, they still, they still haunt us. And everybody keeps telling me things have improved. You know, things are better, but all we need to do is look at Instagram, you know, and look at all the apps and look at the fact that women are now completely effacing their faces because we want to look younger and prettier. And, and what I wanted to do with this film and what I wanted to say is that all of it has to do with the fact that we have no power. And if we just understand power, that this is all that this is about. We don't have power. We don't have power globally and we don't have power nationally. We just don't have power. And while we have careers and we've obviously made progress, and I'm not saying that we haven't, the goal of this film was to bring about a movement for men and for women. For it, And I call it now, I'm calling it here, I'm naming it here, um, Movement 360, where men get to empathize with women and women in a way get to empathize with men because power is responsibility and money is responsibility. And if we women had all the money and the power, I honestly don't know what we would be like. You know, that would be kind of fun to find out. <laughs> um, but, but the idea of this is that if we can empathize through an art form, if men can empathize, if you can live for two hours or an hour and a half in our shoes and imagine your body constantly on display, um, maybe, maybe, just maybe, we would have some kind of symbiotic relationship between the genders. And maybe we will get to a place where um, there's equality, uh, not just, you know, real equality. So yeah, this is a long, a long thing. <laughs> no, that's great. Uh, I mean, no, it, it, it makes a lot of the points. It makes it, you know, overtly clear with, you know, the pageant and everything. Um, talk to me about uh, the, the journey. So you wrote the script. Yes. And then take me from there. You write the script. How long does it take you to go from script to screen? Talk to me about that journey. So, yeah, the actual process of this was um, I made a show, a little web series called Happy Hour Feminism. And I had written 12 episodes. And um, one of the episodes was a pageant. Uh, the episodes had wolf period elixir in it. Um, you know, it was, the, it was the same concept. It took place in a bar. And, you know, I've been struggling with this concept for a long time. I've been kind of playing with it and everything like that. And, uh, and I thought, you know, the pageant episode is pretty, is pretty good. It's pretty interesting. It's pretty funny. It has a lot of fun, fun moments. And so, but I had already written that episode it, and then I decided to make, believe it or not, a 20 minute episode. This was supposed to be 20 minutes, um, but I got an amazing cast. I had an amazing cast. These were some of the most incredible men I've ever worked with. They were so respectful. They were so with it. Um, the process of the women I knew from other projects and I'd worked with all the women so I knew everybody but the men were all new uh, the women I'd worked with the men were all new and what I basically did I had lots and lots of people apply for the jobs and and it would happen and I would call up we would have like these zoom calls and I would say to the guys the, during the interviews how do you feel being in your underwear you know for like a lot of the time while we're filming you? And how do you feel about talking about your body? Do you feel comfortable talking about your body? And if the answer was yes, and both counts, that put them up, you know, because I had like a thousand people, I can't remember how many people, a thousand people applied for these jobs. And, and so I always, right? And I looked for those men who were the most comfortable and they were the most like, and I would say, listen, this is a feminist project. I just want you to know what you're signing up for. And they would all be like, yeah, <laughs> you know? And you know, at first I thought, oh, they're just doing that because they want the job. But as we started filming and as we got through the process, 
they were so incredibly respectful and they so went with it, you know? I, I mean, it took rehearsal and it took, it took a huge learning curve for both women and men. So if you can imagine, I'm saying to all the women, you guys are gonna have to grab them. You know, you're gonna have to like, and the women are like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> and, 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 and it was, you know, and the men had to sometimes, you know, the guy who was overweight in, in, in the, in the film, um, it breaks my heart that I did to him what I did to him. And sometimes he would almost cry. And there were people on set who like thought that I was just such a bitch. And I'd be like, we are acting, you know? There are overweight women out there who are suffering from this, and I want to show that. And, you know, but he, he would get really hurt and, and really offended. And it was, it, it made each of the men at the end of the film said, it's changed my life. The process of doing this, the process of living in your skin. Um, but the journey was, I'm sorry, the journey was I wrote the script, I wrote the happy hour feminism uh, thing, then I decided in the beginning to make a 20 minute little thing with all of them and it was going to be an episode as part of my web series. And then as we started filming and as I saw how talented they all were, I, I started to kind of, so, and because I didn't tell myself that it was a feature film, I did it. Do, do you know what I mean? Because I think that if I started with, and then we just we just filmed so much and we got so much footage that it was clearly it was clearly a full movie. And and then we had um, a day where we filmed and it just looked like the '80s and it was just really bad. So I like changed everything and did a whole new look. So it was it was a process. No, it's a great process. So I'm gonna switch it a little bit. You know, I'm also a filmmaker and everything, and you know, we put ourselves out there as a writer, as a director, as a, first as a writer, you're making yourself vulnerable. Then you're making yourself even more vulnerable as a director. You went the whole field of making yourself vulnerable. You went as a writer, as a director, as an actress, uh, having sex on screen, and then at the very end, really telling your truth. How does that make you feel? Like you have now put your, this is who you are. You have now put yourself out there to that audience. Um, I like to say that I'm every woman. I like to say that I'm nobody. Uh, I'm just channeling others who don't have the guts to do what I do. And I, as embarrassing as some of this is, um, it's nothing in a way because there are so many others who suffer. And you and I are artists and we say it. And in a way I feel a responsibility to everyone I know, to every woman who's ever told me her story. Um, Cause I do have the courage to do this. And I'm not afraid to say what happened to me. And I'm not afraid to do crazy stuff and be totally embarrassed. Um, and I want every woman out there to feel like they can say it. And one of the things that um, hurts me deeply is when women tell me stories about, you know, when they've been sexually assaulted or when they've been raped, they won't go on with their lives. They process, they get depressed, they go into therapy, they have PTSD. And one thing that I did, I did get sexually assaulted at a film festival a month before filming this. And I said, if I lay down and cry, then he wins. And it was a pretty horrific sexual assault. It was by another filmmaker. He did terrible things. I fought him and nobody helped me. I told the film festival directors afterwards and nobody did anything about it. And it was already post, uh, I like to say the Harvey Weinstein moment. Um, but what's important about it is that, you know, I went on and I said, you know what, I'm gonna put a film together. And maybe, maybe one day the film will help somebody else. But I'm not gonna wallow in this and it, because then 
whoever that person is, whoever did that to you, they win. Because you then lay down and can't move forward. Well, I mean, even jumping off of that, why do you think people don't want to help women? Like, there was just that story a couple weeks ago on a New York subway, woman gets raped. And people watched it. Some people filmed it and popped it up on YouTube. And, you know, now the DA is saying that it didn't all happen that way. But yeah, that happened in New York. Why don't people want to help women? I, I mean, you know, my answer to that is, of course, because power. Because power remains a factor. Because 